Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really happy to see you all in this beautiful evening at this wonderful public lecture. I am Engineer Sasitharan, member of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. On behalf of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, I warmly welcome you all uh, to the lecture on allocation of risk and responsibility in contracts which book to use. Ladies and gentlemen, our mother Lanka is the one thing unites us together even though we have different views and beliefs among us. Please rise to pay our tribute to the mother nation through our national anthem. Thank you very much. To survive and thrive in the today's challenging business environment, commercial contract management has become very high priority. Allocation of risk and responsibility is an important step in the contractual management. Although there are many contracts used in the construction and engineering, they are fundamentally and differential differentiated by the allocation of risk and responsibility to the parties to the contract. The different FIDIC and SIDA contract forms that are widely used in Sri Lanka are also based on allocation of risk and responsibility. This lecture aims at giving the audience a basic understanding of this risk allocation so that they acquire an understanding of the contract forms they use. It's my duty to introduce uh, engineer Malik Mendes, the presenter to you all. Engineer Malik Mendes is a civil engineer 
arbitrator and adjudicator and a FIDIC accredited lecturer trainer in management of construction contracts and review of the 2017 FIDIC contracts. He is the only FIDIC accredited lecturer trainer in South Asia and one of three accredited by FIDIC to train English in Asia. Engineer Malik Mendes is the Sri Lanka country representative of the Institution of Civil Engineers UK and the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation. He is a past president of Association of Consulting Engineers Sri Lanka, a fellow and a council member of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers UK, member Capacity Building Committee of FIDIC, member of the Society of Structural Engineers Sri Lanka and an associate member of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK. Engineer Malik Mendes serves in many standing had ad hoc dis uh, dispute adjudication boards and in arbitral tri tribunals. He is in the panel of arbitrators and adjudicators of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka and in the panel of adjudicators Association of Consulting Engineers Sri Lanka. He is a faculty member and lecturer at the Institute, Institute of Development of Commercial Law and Practice. Engineer Malik Mendes has worked in many large projects worldwide in hydropower projects, industrial building projects, hospital, ports and harbour and other projects. Mr. Malik Mendes is a former CEO of the Lanka Hydraulic Institute and currently serving as chairman of Mendes Cobain Consultant Private Limited. Engineer Malik Mendes, it's over to you sir. Thank you very much, Asidharan, for your kind words. Um, today, I, uh, I was asked whether I'd like to come and speak, and I thought the best thing would be to do something from the usual lecturing and workshops I do for FIDIC uh, in, uh, in contract management, and use some of those slides to give an understanding today of what contracts are. We learn a lot of things in the technical front. Go to a lot of technical seminars, we go to a lot of technical conferences, but we don't learn enough about contracts. And that's a weakness in, in some of the construction personnel in Sri Lanka, and I hope that I'll be one of the people who will be able to change some of that. Um, before I move on, I must say that some of these slides are from my guru, Jeff Smith, who is a very senior trainer in FIDIC contracts. Um, he's also an arbitrator who works around the world. And some of these slides are uh, are from FIDIC standard slides, hmm? uh, which is basically standardized for most of the training that we do. <coughs> um, many construction projects end in dis disputes because there are unsuitable contract forms are used or contract provisions are misunderstood. Uh, so today hopefully you live here with a better understanding of which book or which risk allocation you should use in your contracts. Uh, I have seen several times uh, they are design build contracts but using uh, the construction contract with some provisions made in the special conditions. And then claims come in and in the construction contracts claims are understandable. There are a lot of areas in which there is claimability but these are not recognized by the employer and then usually it ends up in disputes which uh, leads on to adjudication and arbitration and when you have arbitration lawyers get involved and legal points come in and it goes on for several years. Um, one project I was in which is a two year project, the arbitration went on for seven years, the dispute went on for seven years. Uh, although there are many construction contracts used in construction and engineering, they are fundamentally differentiated by the allocation of risk and responsibility to the parties. In usual construction contracts there is an employer and the contractor. Now, how do, you, how do you allocate risk to each party? Is that what it based on? So hopefully, in the next many slides, I will say a few. I repeat some of these slides to make sure you understand hmm? uh, how this allocation of risk and responsibility is done in the contracts uh, used today. Then I also not only introduce you to FIDIC and FIDIC contract, but also talk about the CEDA or ICTAD contracts, how they are similar. Actually, most of the ICTAD contracts 
or see the contracts are derived from FIDIC contracts. Hmm? Uh, so I'll be talking about SBD2, SBD3, SBD4, but also about the FIDIC red book, the yellow book and the silver book, which are. So I might repeat some of these slides, but that is to ensure that you understand. Uh, now even the FIDIC CEDA contracts that are used are based on allocation of risk and responsibility. Hmm? The, so my lecture today aims at giving a basic understanding and how they should be applied. All the focus on FIDIC, FIDIC contracts, they apply similar to any other contract, maybe JCT contract or others. There are a lot of confusion in how you pay or how you measure, but that is not the important. Where do you allocate risk is the important thing in figuring out where you stand in the contract. Where does the employer stand? Where does the contractor stand? <coughs> now to introduce you to FIDIC, uh, founded in 1913, FIDIC stands for Federation International Deck Engineers Councils. It's a French term, um, so FIDIC is that. It composed of national associations in consulting engineering in different countries. Now the Association of Consulting Engineers Sri Lanka is a FIDIC member association here. Now I and several people here were involved in the Association of Consulting Engineers and it promotes and implements consulting engineering industry strategic goals. Members endorse FIDIC statutes, policy statements and comply with FIDIC code of ethics. It shows not only is it in contracts but it you know, promotes and develops business practice on how to best practice as a consulting engineer. So it basically looks after the construction consulting engineering industry. It's an industry association, not a professional institution. So FIDIC uh, has several areas in which they work, integrity management, which is FIMS, FIDIC integrated management system, project sustainable management, quality management, risk management. So in large area, although we only see the contracts most of the time. So in a large area and then um, we have extensive programs of seminars and conferences. Now, July will be the FIDIC Asia Pacific Conference in Delhi. Um, you can attend some of you if you look up FIDIC Asia Pacific 2019. Um, it also has international training programs, capacity development programs, uh, so which are some of the module one to four training programs that are held. Uh, I am most accredited in module one, which is what I do. Then capacity development programs, accredited trainers, how do you assess trainers? It's very difficult to become a trainer because you are assessed over five days. Training suppliers, programs and events. Then it publishes business practice guides on how to practice consulting engineering. And then the International Professional Services Agreement, that is usually the employer to consultant agreements. Hmm? A client consultant agreement is called client consultant agreement. Then of course works contracts that we are mostly familiar with. Most of you use FIDIC contracts or the works contracts or use CEDA contract which are you know, derived from FIDIC contracts. <coughs> but if you are in an ADB World Bank project, you will be using the FIDIC contract but modify to suit the bank's requirements. So I will talk about all that today and hopefully you get a good understanding of contracts and when you go to work tomorrow, you will be able to look at contracts in a different way hopefully. Um, the first FIDIC works contract was published in 1957. So as you can see, it's a long time ago. Uh, and we tend, what has been evolved over so many 60 odd years, we think we can change in one hour. We have seen a lot of problems starting because of these contracts being changed, the clauses being deleted completely. It is known as the original conditions of contract for works of civil engineering construction known as a red book. So what happened was they gave it for printing and the printer put red color on the book cover. So it became the red book. Then you know, all these different colors were put on the books so to identify the different forms of contract. Second edition was published in 1969 and reprinted in 1973. So 1973 version followed closely the fourth edition of the English IC conditions of contract. So it followed very closely the issue of civil engineers conditions of contract. So it was written that as a general comment, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that at least one primary object in preparing the present international contract was to depart little as humanly possible from the English conditions. So it's Fidic has adapted or copied, I would say, the IC conditions of contract. But now Fidic contracts have gone a lot bigger way. And IC conditions of contract, which are called new engineering contracts, now are only used in a few countries. 
like UK, Hong Kong, and maybe in South Africa. So you can see how it has evolved, and FIDIC is now the most widely used contracts in the world. So as in the UK, an important role was um, reserved for the engineer. Mm -hmm. So the engineer who is seen as an impartial party uh, between the employer and the contractor who will look after the project. And the contract was to be paid according to the actual quantities expressed by application of unit rate. So you basically re-measure and pay. The third edition of the Red Book was published in 1977, conditions of general conditions and conditions of particular application. Suggestions upon which the parties are required to make their own agreement. So it was the general conditions to be unchanged, but you can make some changes in the particular conditions. So that was allowed. As with the English IC conditions, there was also form of tender, appendix to tender, and a form of agreement. So those were also added to these books, and the, it was published in 1977. The first three editions of the Red Book was assumed that the detailed design will be provided to the contractor by the employer or the engineer. So in the Red Book, the employer will provide to the contractor the designs, the detailed design, okay? and the contractor only does the construction, gets all instructions from the engineer or the consultant. So the Red Book was unsatisfactory for contracts where major items of plant and machinery were made, manufactured outside site. Mm -hmm. So let's say turbines or generators or whatever in the power plant. This led to the first edition of the FIDIC Yellow Book. So the FIDIC Yellow Book came which is called the Mechanical Electrical Works Contracts with an emphasis on testing and commissioning and more suitable for manufacturing and installation of plant. The second edition was published in 1980. So it was evolving. So the red book was there and the yellow book came in, hmm, more catered towards electrical and mechanical works. Then new edition of both the red book and yellow book were published in 1987. I know some of the government institutions here still use a 1987 book. Now we have got to the 2017 version, but we are still using 1987 and adding all kinds of things, subtracting all kinds of things and adding new things which causes a lot of confusion. And what has been well thought out over the last 60 years is neglected. The Red Book 4th edition 1987 includes an express term which requires the engineer to act impartially when giving a decision or taking action which might affect the rights and obligations of the party. So he introduced this term to act impartially. Now we have in some of the developing countries where the engineer is an employee of the employer. So obviously he can't act impartially, so which is fundamentally wrong in the first place. It should be a separate independent party who should be the engineer. So we have this problem of having an engineer who is an employee of the employer and having an employment agreement which means that he can't be insubordinate to the employer. So he can't give a decision against the employer. He can't make a fair determination, he has been told what to do. So, but 1987 at that time introduced being impartial. Now it has come to 2017, it's called, now it's also called that the engineer has to be neutral. Impartial, independent and neutral. So engineering is an important part. The Red Book 4th edition was published in 1996 which gave an option for a dispute adjudication board. A dispute adjudication board is before you go to arbitration if you have a dispute you put it to the dispute adjudication board and in 1996 the first dispute adjudication board came in the, in the Red Book. Mm -hmm. An option for payment on a lump sum basis instead of by reference to bill of quantity. So the Red Book also allowed an option of using a lump sum uh, basis based on a schedule of payments hmm? instead of by reference to bill of quantity. So that's also allowed in, in the Red Book from 1996. By this time, FIDIC has responded to the increase in popular projects being procured on a design, build, or turnkey basis. This resulted in the conditions of contract for design, build, and turnkey, which was 1995, what's called the Orange Book. Orange Book is no longer there, it's basically been replaced by the Silver Book. But I will explain to you how it went on. So this mostly came about with the massive expansion in the Middle East, where the, you know people in the Middle East wanted something done where there's least involvement by the employer, give everything to the contractor, mm? from the concept design to all that will be done by the contractor. I guess if you are digging oil off the ground, you can afford to pay more mm? and leave all the risk to the contractor. The 1995 Orange Book replaced the traditional engineer by the employer's representative. So obviously showing a bias that the is on the employer's side. The express required to impartial was also removed all the way determining value, cost or extension of time the employer's representative had to determine the matter fairly, reasonably and in accordance with the contract itself. 
So he still was required to act fairly, determine, make fair determinations and be reasonable. Need to submit matters to the engineer for his decision prior to an ability to pursue dispute was eliminated. In its place, an independent dispute adjudication board was seen as a standard provision. So the Orange Book had again dispute boards coming in. Okay. Now 1999 books are what we have been using until very recently. Even now we are using until the 2017 books came out. So 1999 was a watershed year. There was a red, yellow, and orange book. Of course, now it's changed to silver book. The red book was a construction book. Uh, then the yellow book is plant and design build was called and the orange book EPC turnkey, engineer procurement con constru construction turnkey projects. Uh, the orange book became the silver book a bit later on. M so to standardize the terminology. Most of the terminology is, is similar in all the books. Make the documents as user friendly as possible and solve the problem of engineer not seen as acting impartial when he is employed and paid by the employer. All books contain a DAB provision, that is a dispute adjudication board is there in all the books. So if you are unhappy with what the engineer has made determined, you can go to the dispute board and get a decision. So that was allowed in the 1999 books. Of course in the red book it is a standing board, where the dispute board is appointed as soon as the project starts, so they can solve problems as they go along. The yellow and silver books, they were ad hoc boards. Now Philip publishes five widely used books. There's the red book, the famous construction book where employer gives a detailed design to the contract and contract does the construction. There's a plant and design build book where the contract will do the detailed design and do the construction. Then the silver book, the EPC turnkey book where employer has very little to do. He says, I want a 500 megawatt power plant, the contract has to do the rest of it. Employer doesn't hardly get involved. Hmm? Then of course, there's a design, build and operate book, which is used for where the contract has to design, build and operate for a period of time. Hmm? You, know, you can be, can be a harbor terminal or a metro or whatever. Then of course, there's a short form of contract to be used for small contracts, hmm? small, simple projects. Now, I will, I might repeat some of these things to make you sure you understand. The construction contract, the red book, is based on decide to provide by the employer and payment is made on a remeasurement basis. So it's fundamentally a remeasurement contract. But of course you can have the option of lump sum uh, schedule of payments also in the red book. But it's fundamentally considered a remeasurement contract where you remeasure and pay the contractor. The plan contract, which is a design build and plan contract, which is yellow book, the design build and operate contract, which is a gold book, and the EPC turnkey contract, silver book, are based on design by the contractor. In all that, the contractor has been asked to do the detailed design. And payment is made on a lump sum basis, lump sum basis or a schedule of payments. In addition, there is of course a client consultant model agreement. Now you can use for a client consultant model agreement. Uh, there's one in CEDA also, but quite different to the uh, FIDIC one. The client consultant model agreement, the new one came in recently. In the short form of contract, the green book. And of course, there's a dredging contract also, hmm, which can be used for dredging. But of course, now since then, uh, there's the emerald book for deep underground works that has come in a few, few weeks ago. And there's also the uh, subcontract book for the red book. So if you are using the red book in the main contract, you can use a subcontract red book. Hmm? I will explain as I go along. So that's also available. Um, so for the time being, uh, there's also the pink book, which is based on the red book, where the design is by the employer, which is used by the banks. Hmm? Uh, Asian Development Bank, World Bank projects, or Inter American Bank, it's, it's a lot of banks together, produces a pink book, but there are no uh, the multilateral development bank versions for the yellow, green, gold, or silver books, only for the red book. Hmm? It's called the pink book. The main difference between the pink book and the red book is the pink book allows involvement of the bank. So, some of you who might be in ADB or World Bank projects, or, or maybe even some commercial banks are using this, you find that. The pink book allows involvement of the bank, includes provision for dealing with suspension or disbursement by the bank. If the bank dis stops disbursement, suspends disbursement, what do you do? So that provision is also allowed in the contract. Imposes similar deadlines on the employer as in the contractor. So there are 
similar uh, deadlines for the employer, let's say for if the employer wants to uh, claim delay damages, uh, in the red book it says as soon as practicable you must give notice of, of deducting delay damages, but in the pink book it says within 28 days also. So there are certain deadlines of the employer. As much get emphasis on social issues, so staff and labor has a 12, 12 14 more clauses. Mm -hmm. Uh, then also has a great emphasis on anti-corruption measures. So anti-corruption measures also for each bank, this is different anti-corruption measures. So that's how the pink book is different from the red book. Are any of you using the pink book at the moment in any of these contracts you're using? Okay, so pink book basically is derived from the red book. When I worked in the, in the Colombo Harbor project, the Brayport project, we called it at, at that time the modified red book. Mm -hmm. I'll drink some water. Called the modified red book, we just adapted the red book and changed it to what the Asian Development Bank wanted. Then let's look at risk analysis. Before I get back into how the allocation is done. So fundamentally, if you think about it, the red book, the design risk lies with the employer. Hmm. But in the yellow book, the design bill book, the design responsibility passes on to the contractor. But there are project risks are divided into mainly insurable risks, things that are risk or loss, damage or injury occurring during construction, including consequences of accidents due to defective design, defective material, defective workmanship, those are called insurable risks, those you can insure. And then there are mainly uninsurable risks. You can't insure these risks. Like this lead to financial or time loss with the impact on the project into late position of the site, delay in receipt of necessary information, changes in design, variation in the original contract, you can't insure those things. Hmm? Remember, if you put too much risk on the contractor, the price will go up because the contract will or the tender will, will price into his, will put into his price the risk he is taking. So if you put too much risk onto the contract, the price will be high. So you will find you go from the red book to the silver book where you are putting more and more risk on the contractor, the price will usually be higher. The amount you pay, the contract price will be higher. Maybe there will be no bidders or maybe he will get only inexperienced bidders who cannot see and allow for the risk. So if you put too much risk as an employer into the contractor, you will invariably pay more even if the risk event doesn't happen. And also risk can be divided into two categories, unavoidable and manageable. Now, whenever feasible, risk should be transferred to insurers. So if it's unavoidable, you should try and put it on to insurance, you, insurers. You will, things like earthquake or floods or something like that should go on to accidents or design fault, you can put it to insurance. You will design uh, problems, you can put it to professional indemnity insurance. Responsible and manageable risk should be allocated to the best party able to manage and control the risk. If the employer bears certain of the risk, he will have to pay the financial impact only if the risk event happens. It's a very important statement here. <coughs> if the employer bears certain of the risk, he will have to pay the financial impact only if the risk event happens. Then there will be a claim. Hmm? If the contractor bears a risk, he will allow for it in his tender and the employer pays even if the risk event doesn't happen. So basically, if you put the risk on to the contractor, even if that risk event doesn't happen, he will price it into his, into his tender. Hmm? So you will find in a silver book where you put all the risk on to the contractor, the price will necessarily be high. Of course, in the Middle East, they are not too bothered about the price. They want the project done. So. Asian Development Bank, World Bank is interested in how much it's going to cost. They want the least cost. So they will take the employer to take most of the risk and will pay only if the risk event happens. Hmm? Let's go on. Now, basic risk allocation in the books are like this. If you ignore the gold book, which is very similar to the yellow book, the red book, employer takes most of the risk. There is a Employee design contract, employee test most of the risk. But in the yellow book, where the contract does a design, the detailed design and quantities goes on to the contractor. But in the silver book, the contractor takes most of the risk. 
So he can't claim if there are unforeseen ground conditions. He can't claim more money. Hmm? He can't claim more money and time if there's exceptional climatic conditions. That's also contractor's risk. So basically going from the red book to the silver book is you're putting more and more risk onto the contract. Hmm? So invariably, if you the contract takes more risk, the price will be higher. Even if that risk doesn't happen, he will price it, put the amount into his tender because uh, he has to take that risk. Mm. So the three books are basically the red book is like SBD 2 and the yellow book is like the SBD 4 in CEDA contracts. We don't, we don't have a CEDA contract for the silver EPC turnkey book. Mm. These two are available. And that's of course SPD 2 is 3 is the short form of contract we talked about earlier for use of small contracts. But the risk allocation is this. Most of the contracts are based on the risk allocation. So if you take a contract today, have a look at and see where is the risk allocated in this contract. Is it designed to be done by the contractor? It's a design build contract. Are there more risk put on the contractor? Then you are going more towards a silver book EPC turnkey contract. So invariably, contract will either take the risk, the price will be higher. Hmm? Or the contract doesn't know what risks he has and you price it low and we go for the lowest price and we end up in problems. So you can say some of the underground deep tunneling works we are doing in this country not only have a technical problem, but also contractual problems. Because we are given them on silver book contracts. Where even the contract doesn't know, God, only God knows what is several kilometers underneath. Huh? Sorry about that. Alarm telling me to take some medicine. I'm at that age, I guess. Uh, so I hope you understand up to now. Uh, usually in a workshop, I will of course ask, are there any questions now? But then this is supposed to be a lecture, you know, evening lecture. But I allow you to ask questions later on, and hopefully I'll come back to these slides if necessary. So you can see how it all depends on how the risk is allocated. Hmm? So whether there is payment in this way or payment in that way or 10% uh, uh, delay damages or 10% retention doesn't make much of a difference. Where is the risk allocated? What are the risk conditions? What are, where is the risk allocated? And this is the reason why FIDIC is the most widely used. ADB has a uh, while back and just signed for the new contracts is because the risk allocation is clear in FIDIC contracts. That's the reason why SEED has adopted FIDIC contracts because the risk allocation is clear. Mm, there is no confusion in that. Every risk has been thought about and put into and I think the 2017 books are even bigger. They are called a 3 kilogram suite because each book weighs 1 kilogram. Also as a reviewer for the, for the red book and the silver book because everything has been thought out. Every risk has been looked at. Every point where it can become a dead end in the contract management has been looked at and sorted out. More detailed, more prescriptive more notices to be given as necessary. So that's always different. But every risk has been looked at. So that's why FIDIC contracts are much more advanced than other contracts. Now let's look at which book to use again. Hmm? I might be repeating some things, but I hope you understand. That is to just to make sure that you understand. So relatively small value, short construction time or involved in simple or repetitive work, use the short form of contract or the green book. Hmm? SBD3 in CEDA. SBD3 basically taken the green book and made uh, some of the paragraphs into uh, bullet points. Larger or more complex projects, employ the engineer to most of the design construction contract. So the employer or the engineer or the consultant does most of the design. It's a construction contract with a red book or the pink book. So this is the construction contract where the contract only does the construction. Design is given to you. Contract do most of the design, plant and design build, yellow book. Contract do most of the design and takes also for operation for a certain period of time. Of course the DBO, design build and operate book which is a gold book. But fundamentally it's a red book and the yellow book where the, dis, the risk and response you are designed transfers on to the contract. Mm. Then let's look at the silver book. 
The employer who provides finance wishes to implement the project on a fixed price basis with little involvement. He doesn't want to get involved much. Then he uses the EPC turnkey, the silver book. Most of the risk and responsibility lies with the contractor. Hmm? Not only the design, but the risks also lie with the contractor. Contractor has total responsibility for the financing, construction, operation with little supervision from the employer. It's again the silver book. So basically, silver book is a a contract where the employee has very little involvement. He only says what he wants. He only gives a performance criteria. I want a 500 megawatt power plant. He doesn't go and say, you know, I have used coal, it has been this side, it has been this, this kind of cooling system, none of that. He just says, basically, it's like a car. You buy a car, turn the key. Manufacturer has done everything. Designed to build, to manufacture everything done by the contractor or the supplier. Hmm? So it's somewhat like a turnkey contract is where the employer has very little to do. Let's look at this again. Red book. Conditions of contract for construction. The side is given to the contractor. Payment is based on remeasurement. Rates and price and BOK apply to actual quantities. Of course, there's an option for lump sum also, but mostly fundamentally this is a remeasurement contract. Supervision by the engineer. Mm -hmm. Engineer is supposed to be an independent impartial party and we will give fair determinations. Yellow book, conditions of contract for plant and design build, detailed design done by the contractor. So here the design responsibility passes on to the contractor. Payment is based on lump sum, supervision by the engineer, that is still an engineer because only the design responsibility has gone to the engineer will have to review some of these drawings, approve some of these drawings but the design responsibility still lies with the contractor. Mm -hmm. Detailed design responsibility lies with the contractor. And also in the yellow book it says, why the yellow book is different to the red book is, it gives this fit for purpose obligation to the contractor. When he designs and builds a works, he has to take responsibility for fit for purpose. It has to fit for purpose for it, it was designed for and been built, which is not there in the red book. The red book, the designers take that responsibility, not the contractor. Okay. So, it is, of course, in the design consultant contract, which is a client consultant, he says, exercise reasonable skill, there, care and diligence. It still doesn't say fit for purpose, but definitely when it comes to yellow book, the design build contract, it talks about fit for purpose, which is not there in the red book. So, that's why I tell you not to use a red book, the, the construction contract for design build contracts. This obligation is not there. Plus, clause 5 covers design in detail, design conditions in detail. In the red book, that design clause is not there at all. Hmm. Okay, so I just took a slide from somewhere else, but basically the yellow book has this fit for purpose obligation on the contractor, which is not there in the red book. So, red book, yellow book, design responsibility start transfers on to the contractor. Then the silver book, design done by the contractor, payment based on lump sum. Supervision by the contract, but employee maintains a presence through employer's representative if appointed. It's a very hands off attitude. Employer hardly gets involved. He only wants the end product. He just gives a performance criteria. So, it's a matter of trans more and more responsibility to the contractor as you go along from the red book to the yellow book to the silver book. So, it's like SPD 2 to SPD 4. Of course, we don't have a CEDA. Syllabus. Of course, I've been trying to get them to add up free contracts under license so that we can have access to all this white plethora of suite of contracts to use in our projects. Then, of course, there's a goal book, which is, of course, uh, similar to design and build, but also operate. Design done by the contractor, payment based on three lump sums, one for design and build, one for operation, one for assessment replacement. You can have asset replacement or not, but that doesn't matter. But basically, design, build and operate. Supervision by the contract, but employee maintenance presence through employee's representative. Operation phase can be supervised by an auditing body, independent auditing body. Mm -hmm. Then there's of course a green book. SBD 3 in CEDA, short form of contract, interior projects under $500,000 or 6 months. Of course, I won't stick to that. It's something where you can easily do a project. And sometimes an emergency project can be done with this. After tsunami, I used in some projects the green book. Mm -hmm. Design can be by employer or by contractor, payment can be lump sum, remeasurement, cost reimbursement. So it's quite a simple contract. But so none of the none of the conditions are there in this contract. 
Okay. Better not use it if it's a complex project, simple project, simple, you want to build a house, then you might be able to use this. Mm? Let's say things like uh, design, build, drawings and operation manuals to be given to the engineer before uh, taking over is not there in this. It just says engineer go and take it over. So those are things that are not there in this book. It's a very simple contract. Then since 2005, as I said, the pink book came in. Multilateral development banks use the general conditions of the MDB harmonized edition of the PD construction contract. The third edition came in 2010. So uh, maybe some of you will use this new 2010. It's nine years since it came out. Then of course this pink book, um, as I said, is used widely, and it's also downloadable free of charge usually because uh, ADB and World Bank has licensed it to be used widely. Then there are also contract guides available to the main contracts and to the pink book version in FIDIC. Mm -hmm. You can get usually a hard copies of FIDIC contracts for about 40 euro. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, soft copy is more expensive because you can make so many copies and that's it. So, but hard copies, I guess, good enough. Then let's look at this standard FIDIC slide. Again, straightforward project, yes. Simple project, use a short form of contract, SBD3. Mm. No, it's not a straightforward simple project. Is it employee design? Employer or employers, consultant or employers, designers or employers, engineers designing? Yes, use a red book, which is SBD2. And then, of course, you get a subcontract book also, which you can use in the red book. Mm. So, I might be seen as sometimes as you know promoting FIDIC contracts here, but the idea is that you understand FIDIC contracts. Yes, that's no use, we will be using FIDI contracts. Is it a contractor design, plant uh, or high unforeseen risk? Yes, <coughs> we use the design build contract. Is it maintenance? Yes, there is operation also, then you can use the gold book. But uh, contract design, but you know, no major unforeseen risk, little employee involvement, use a silver book. Hmm? So this yellow book is similar to SPD4. SPD2, SPD3, but we don't have a silver book, EPC turnkey contract with CEDA yet, that we can use, here we use the EPC turnkey contract, used it for the uh, birth development at the Colombo Harbour, that because we have built a breakwater, we knew the ground conditions very well, it's inside the harbour, which is already, a breakwater which is already built, so risks were very, very well known, so we use a silver book, it's easier to do. Then let's look at design responsibility. As I said, if you look at design responsibility on the three books, how does it pan out? Before award, employee produces specifications and tender drawings. Hmm? So by the time you get to tender, drawings would have been quite well far developed. Hmm? We'll have an almost good, approximately good <coughs> DOQ in place. After award, employee produces construction drawings, detailed design. So the employee or the employee's designers produce a detailed drawing. Mm -hmm. In the yellow book, employer produces employer's requirement, including possi possibly concept design. Mm -hmm. I call ERQS the employer's requirement, contractor checks the employer's requirements. Any mistake is a variation. So there is a problem with the employer's requirement, any mistake is a variation. Mm -hmm. Then the contractor produces detailed design. Contractor finds a mistake after doing the detailed design in employee's requirement, there must be a variation. Then engineer reviews and approves detailed design. But this still, engineer doesn't take responsibility for the design. The design response lies with the contractor. He just checking that it conforms to somewhat to the contract that he has entered into. In the silver book, it's very different. It's very little employer involvement. Employee produces employee's requirements, usually a performance criteria. Bidders produce concept design, contract checks employees' requirements, any mistake is his problem. Irresponsible. Contractor produces detailed design. Employer reviews some drawings and plan details. Some drawings and plan details. So very little involvement of the employer or the employee's personnel engineers here. So it's basically that way you end up paying more for this because the contract is taking all the risk. Hmm? So basically, it's the risk allocation in contracts. So when you get a contract tomorrow, look to see where the risk allocated. 
is it to the contractor or is it to the employer? Because the employer is more like a red book where the employer will only pay if that risk event happens, if that risk happens. Okay. Structure of the documents. I might be going a bit ahead of more time. Each book contains general conditions, guidance of preparation of particular condition, letter of tender. You are usually familiar with these. General conditions are intended to be used unchanged. You are not supposed to change con general conditions. Don't mutilate it. Huh? Changes suited employees or requirements are illegal and in breach of copyright. If you are going to put in a project or country specific info, put it in the particular conditions. But try not to change general conditions. They have been well thought out over the last 60 years and you want to change it in two hours. Be very careful what you do. You are most likely to end up in dispute. What has been thought out over many years by so many experienced construction personnel and we are trying to change it. Mm -hmm. So basically, there are similar defined words and phrases are used in all 1990 editions. Same thing in 2017 editions. The main exception has been description of the documents in the contract. Construction red book has contract agreement, letter of acceptance, letter of tender, conditions of contract, specification, drawings and schedules. The yellow book has these things plus employees requirements and schedules and contractors proposal. This employees requirement is a very important thing in the yellow plant and design build contract. In the EPC silver book, Contract agreement is the only contract. Now, usually you say you have your letter of tender and there's a letter of acceptance, then that is a contract until the contract agreement is signed. Hmm? But in the silver book, says contract agreement has to be signed for the contract to be in effect. Conditions of contract, employees' requirements, and tender. So, similar words and phrases, but the documents are a bit different. Hmm? So, you can see it's very simple in the EPC silver book where most of the uh, risks are transferred on to the contractor. In the pink book, general conditions, particular conditions, but particular conditions have two parts, contract data and special provisions. Uh, again, this contract data is similar to the appendix to tender. Contract data about the contract, you know, what is the liquidated damages rate, what is the uh, time for completion, what is uh, retention, all that. Pink book is extensively based on the Fidic Red Book, which means that it is intended for use in relation to contracts that contract is provided the design by the employer and it's basically a re-measurement contract. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so clause 1 usually covers general provisions, uh, subject which are in general uh, definitions. Now in FIDIC contracts if, or even in CEDA contracts, if there's a capital letter, a word starts with a capital letter, it has a definition in the contract. Mm -hmm. Then the clause 2 to 5 employ the engineer, contractor and nominated subcontractors. Now these are the red book or the pink book. In the yellow book, the design bill, you will find the clause 5 is regarding design and not about nominal subcontractors. Clause 6 and 7, staff and labor, plant material and workmanship. Clause 8 to 11 is commencement. You shall do the sequence of events during construction. Delays and suspension, tests on completion, employees taking up to defects. Then clause 12 to 14 covers measurement and evaluation, variations and adjustments, contract price and payment. Now in clause 12 in the yellow book, is on uh, test after completion because you don't do measurements in the book. Hmm? Clause 15, 16 termination by employer and suspension and termination by the contractor. Hopefully, it won't happen. Clause 7 is about risk and responsibility. Who takes the risk? How is risk allocated? Basically, it's given here. But you can see from the contracts, their risk allocation is already done in over so many clauses. Clause 18 on insurance. Requirements, clause 19 on force measure, clause 20 on claims, dispute and arbitration. Of course, in the 2017 contracts, they have separated out claims from disputes and arbitration. Because, because you have a claim doesn't mean it's a dispute. Hmm? Now, in the Kalamu South project, breakwater project, there was a lot of claims, but there were no disputes. Because in the red book or the pink book, there are things claimable. Employer doesn't pay unless the, that risk event happens and that problem happens. Hmm? So, claims are normal things in a red book hmm? or in a yellow book. Hmm? In the silver book, claims will be even less because most of the risk lies in the contractor. Then our contract data has usual this uh, contract data or appendix tender time for completion, defects notification period, law is called defects notification period and not defects liability period. Remember that? It's a time to notify a defect. Liability can go on longer until the defect is rectified. Hmm? So, because the confusion now is called defect notification period, 
usually one year within which notification of a defect has to be done. After that one year you can't notify of any defects. Hmm? Then of course example forms are letter of bid, letter of acceptance, contract agreement, dispute board agreement, so all that is there. Dispute adjudication agreements are short because usually every contract has general conditions of dispute adjudication agreement and also procedural rules for the dispute board on how they should conduct their affairs. So agreement itself is usually one page. Unless you are making a lot of changes and I see a lot of employees in this country making a lot of changes to that also. Hmm? They believe that the DAB should be biased towards one side. They are not DAB. Why have you put a DAB in the first place is to make sure that they are above uh, everybody else and that they will give fair determinations and fair decisions. Right then, conditions on their own are not complete. Certain information must be provided in other documents in order to make them complete, notably contract data, appendix tender, special provisions, specification. Information must be carefully coordinated with the other documents in order that, that ensure that the contract as a whole will serve its intended purpose. So try and make sure that all the documents complement each other, not contradict each other. Hmm? Specifications can include these things, requirements of contractors, documents, permission being obtained by the employer, setting out information, environmental constraints, all that can be included in the specification in the contract. Where changes are made to the general conditions, Via the special provisions, the form agreement, the form of tender, form of acceptance, care must be taken to ensure that no ambiguity is created between the documents. It is essential that such drafting tasks are left to experienced personnel with the relevant experience, including contractual, technical, and procurement aspects. So, if you are going to make any changes, make sure that it doesn't end up in dispute. The bid documents should be prepared by suitably qualified engineers or construction person I will say, familiar with the technical aspect of the works and reviewed by suitably qualified lawyers. Also ensure that it conforms to the law of the country. Hmm? So that is also important. Of course you should not allow the lawyers to decide on these contracts, the engineers should decide on these contracts on, based on risk allocation just to ensure that it, we do not contradict or, or violate any law of the land. Thank you. I hope that you have understood better what contracts are. After my few slides, um, I hope it will be useful. Where is Sasidharan? Ah, there. I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, hopefully, ah, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting and informative presentation. I am pretty much sure on how much effort you have put to convert this evening hour into an interesting presentation on very difficult topic for any presenter by your stories behind the color of the books. Definitely, the presentation will be very valuable and young engineers will take back and apply in their day-to-day -day work. Thank you very much. The forum is open for the questions. I will be happy to answer any questions. I will go from here in case I need to refer to the slide. Uh, I hope that you leave this room with a better knowledge of how contracts are set out. Hmm? So I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Or maybe I lecture too well. <laughs> you are not here from the start. Yeah, okay. So the Red Book has a subcontract document. Uh, Red Book has this subcontract. This subcontract is the contract conditions of subcontract for construction, which you can use in the red book. Mm -hmm. So it has uh, related discourse, related claims, really related things that go with each other. Mm -hmm. So it has been so they are working on the yellow book also to have a subcontract yellow book, but still not finished yet. Yes. Yeah. Uh, technical proposal according to the yellow book and he will reach the price according to his proposal. But when we when we come to the uh, ground and uh, work according to the ground condition and uh, social condition, but if there is change 
when he implemented this project, transition must then go into the technical proposal, or what he did could be changed. Yeah. So it basically is when it's a yellow book, as you can see here, any ground conditions, unforeseen ground conditions or unforeseen physical conditions, the contractor can claim. It's not in the silver book. Huh? But in the ground conditions for the yellow book, employers take a risk. So if the ground conditions have changed or you don't know the ground conditions or there's unforeseen ground conditions, it's, it's said to be unforeseen by a, an experienced contractor. Hmm? So if there's unforeseen something, yes, he can make a claim on that. But not in the silver book, but in the yellow book, yes. But he had to show that, that's why, uh, yeah, so in the silver book, if you look at the front few pages of silver book, it says not to use it for deep underground works. Because this, even the contract doesn't know what risk he is getting into. Hmm? But in the yellow book, yes. So even if you have, uh, let's say, Okay, I don't know what particular person, but if you have given site data, your technical information, but then you have made it, you know, you actually require now something deeper, then of course it will be unforeseen at that time. Mm -hmm. So, there's a risk involved. So, try not to go in for deep underground works with the, with the yellow book or even the silver book. Try and stick to the red book. So, the risk is with the employer and if it happens, if there is an unforeseen condition, you have to pay. But definitely yellow book, it says unforeseen ground conditions or physical conditions, you have to uh, pay the contractor for that. Hmm? It's claimable. Not in the silver book. Hmm? One additional question. Yeah. In silver book, is there any contractor, contractor technical proposal? Can be Before? Not before Why? While contractor B can be requested, contractor's technical proposal, when we are going to see what? Um, not really. What you do is you give a uh, performance criteria and then you submit concept drawings. Uh, uh, what I mean? Uh, in the syllabus. Yeah, in, uh, I, I want to go with the syllabus. Why do you want to go with the Sorry? Why do you want to go with the yeah, because I want to transfer from the risk to the contract. Ah, okay, yeah, okay. Just, just think that. Then, 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 then you should mention only the technical, as long as he produces what you require in your employee requirement, that's all there is. You should get involved in his technical uh, details. That's up to him. Yes. Okay. When you see the book, yeah, that's all up to him. Hmm? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> so, see the book. If you are not sure of the risk and the contractor is not sure of the risk, you most likely end up in trouble. So that's what happened to some of the underground works that we have given on, on silver book contracts. Huh? Houses are sinking, uh, wells are running dry. It's not only a technical problem, it's a contractual problem also. The contractor can't claim anything more. So contractors are c cutting corners. So it's a contractual problem also. Huh? They have given a contract where they shouldn't have given that contract. Don't quote me though, but that's what happened. Yes. That's up to you. Uh, Phoenix doesn't specify exactly. It just says that you, if the contractor is doing design, you ask for professional indemnity insurance. That's for you to decide. Sometimes it can be very expensive. You know, you ask for 25 years professional liability or something, then it becomes the insurance can become more bigger than the than the contract. And then, portion indemnification is not available too much in this part of the world. That's a problem. So, so is value engineering. If the contract comes up with a proposal that is technically different to you, then you pass on the design risk to him for that. You know, even in the report, that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the contractor's proposal, how it is handled after awarding the contract? Contractor's proposal has to conform to the employee's requirement. Unless there is a fault in the employee's requirement. As I said here, uh, as I said here, if there is a mistake in the employee's requirement, it will be a variation. 
Otherwise, the contractor's proposal has to conform to the employee's requirement. Unless you can prove that there's a mistake. You have to conform to the employee's requirement. Unless it's a mistake on your part. The problem is, CEDA SPD4, if you look at the priority of documents, you find the contract proposal has higher priority than the employer's requirement. If you look at the yellow book, it's the other way around. Uh, so that, that is a problem. I think they are going to correct that in the next next books that have been published. See that. <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a problem, and I told them that, and uh, hoping they will correct in the next day. Come up with a new book. Uh, hopefully, there are enough unit contracts that have been well thought out. Uh, this is a problem. As I said, the problem of somebody in half an hour changing these things. So, if you look at the yellow book, yellow book priority documents, and look in the SPD four priority documents, it's all the way around. Yes, sir, Soga. Yes, sir. Pardon? Okay, we we'll see that. Yes. Okay. I don't know what they are coming out with. I've been telling them to adapt FIDIC contracts suitable to. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. And uh, no price reduction. That is that is fun. No, I think that's fundamentally against where, where, where the yellow book stands. Yeah. Yeah. Many, many I know a lot of problems. You know, I, we have highways being built on red book which are designed to contracts. We just sort of understood where this risk lie. So we end up in problems. Yeah. Even unfortunately, uh, they have insisted that first now there are certain things that are coming to the underground. The employee says the first to pay well. You have to be careful when uh, doing the first uh, excavation. And if there is damage, the contract must carry the but must do the repair and it won't pass. That's how they are that's they are going. So that has been proved whether he has not taken due care and, and diligence required to do the work, of course. You know, if it's the, the contract has not taken an adequate safety precautions. I don't know. Yeah, that, no, it is not that. It's now not that. that. That's unforeseen. Unforeseen, right, okay. Yeah. And even they are not even the rights of now the contract is starting. Yeah. It's scary, it's very but it damages the table. And they say that you have to repair it at your cost. So it's basically an unforeseen physical obstruction. Yeah, yeah. So that had to be that's claimable, definitely claimable in the yellow book. So okay, I hope I hope that finishes the questions. Okay, anyway, I I am on moneytem at gmail.com. Uh, my email address manitam at gmail.com. I I can give you we have contract stand if you have a question, but I might not be able to give you a vision on dispute. But definitely we have unique contract stand, I can tell. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, to present the token of appreciation, I kindly call upon Professor Ranjit Disanayake, Chairman, Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. Thank you very much, Professor Ranjit Desanayake. To present the vote of thanks, I kindly call upon Engineer Dhamnikar, the Secretary, Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. Sir, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank Engineer Malik Mendis for delivering an important, very nice and valuable lecture, spending your valuable time. Thank you, Engineer. Uh, Malik Mendis. Next, I must thank all the members of the Civil Engineer Sectional Committee for organizing this event for a successful way. And also, I would like to thank for the staff of ISL for supporting to, uh, to give their support to successful. And finally, I must thank all of you for your participation. Thank you very much. 
and uh, there is another very small announcement. The civil engineer section of the committee will be arranged for the next home at 6.30. Thank you very much.